The endpoints for treating high blood pressure, how do we succeed? Well, certainly blood pressure lowering medications, they lower blood pressure, right? Definitely no question about it. In fact, when you read the scientific studies on high blood pressure treatment, what do you find? Yes, drug A lowers blood pressure as well as drug B. But do they reduce the risk of dying of heart disease? No, they do not. Do they reduce the risk of stroke? A little bit. Do they have uh, side effects and complications? <laughs> okay. We are taught by the, uh, the provocatively dressed drug representatives. <laughs> I'm being kind. And by drug companies that high blood pressure medicine is very effective. It cuts the risk of stroke in half. And you think there as a practitioner, which I assume a good share of you are, is I would be foolish if I did not treat my patients with high blood pressure pills because treating with high blood pressure pills cuts the risk of stroke nearly in half. Well, if you look at the scientific research, this is what you find. The risk of stroke for five years is what we're looking at in people who have mild hypertension between 90 to 110 millimeters of mercury. If you don't treat them, they have 15 chances of having a stroke out of every 1,000 people left untreated. But if you treat them, their risk is now nine chances out of every 1,000 patients. So what do we have here? We have a risk reduction over five years. That's 15 minus nine, which is six, divided by 15, or we have a relative risk reduction of 40%. That's a relative risk reduction, but that's not the way we should look at things, is it? The risk of stroke for five years in terms of absolute reduction is strict six strokes per 1,000 people over five years. That's one less stroke per year by treating 1,000 people with medication. Looks a little bit different, doesn't it? So what we do is we talk in terms of relative versus absolute risk reduction, which makes no sense at all. It makes a profitable sense, but no sense in terms of the welfare of our patients. The other thing that disease monitoring does is it expands the definition of sickness. Now, when Walter Kempner was taking care of high blood pressure patients, his blood pressure patients came in with blood pressures of like 200 over 140. And by the way, he got 60% of them down to normal blood pressures. When I started in medicine, high blood pressure, it was called mild high blood pressure, was 160 over 100. And soon it became 140 over 90, and then there was a report, actually the first report came out about 18 years ago, but another one came out a couple of years ago, that said if your blood pressure was 120 over 80 or greater, you had twice the risk of dying of heart disease. Made national headlines. I'm sure the PR people, the spin doctors of the drug companies made sure everybody learned about that. Now that is true. If your blood pressure is elevated, it is an indication that you have higher risk of having diseases associated with a Western diet. It's a sign, it's a sign that says you're sick. But does treating signs necessarily solve the problem? Well, the drug company thinks that we ought to do that, even though the, the results of treatment don't show those benefits. And so we have people, we have doctors out there treating patients with blood pressures of 120 over 80 or higher, or maybe 110 over 70 or higher. Remember that's prehypertension. And so you expand the market greatly by, by expanding the definition of sickness. Now this is the guideline that I use and the one I would encourage you to use. It's from the British literature. It's the most current guideline on treating high blood pressure. And this is why I don't feel uncomfortable at all taking patients off blood pressure lowering medications. This is why I don't feel uncomfortable having my patients blood blood pressures of 140 over 90 or 150 over 95 without medication. It's because of the British guidelines. The British guidelines has looked carefully at the scientific literature and made some profound statements that ought to dictate our practice. In these guidelines, there's some reports say that all people with high blood pressure, borderline or high normal blood pressure, should be advised on lifestyle modifications. Now, how many doctors do you think do that? I mean, do you think a patient goes into a doctor's office and when the blood pressure is detected, the first thing the doctor does is says you're going to take a 10-week a diet and lifestyle course before I put you on drugs? Do you think that ever happens? Or do you think maybe more likely what happens is when the patient comes into the doctor's office, the first reading of elevated blood pressure dictates a lifelong treatment for high blood pressure. Do you think that's possible? I think so. And then they go on and they say you should initiate drug therapy if sustained, sustained. That doesn't mean like 15 minutes. That means like months. If sustained, greater than 160 systolic and 100 or greater di diastolic. That's what the British guidelines say. Now, if you feel uncomfortable about not initiating high blood pressure therapy for what you know is less than mild hypertension, 
or you feel uncomfortable about taking people off of blood pressure medications, just use the British guidelines. It's the most current recommendations out there, and I believe much less biased because I believe the British literature is much less influenced than the U.S. literature. Okay, disease mongering. Here's another way to do it. You exaggerate the goals of treatment. The goal, I tell you, I, I just can't not even think of any patient who's come in with other than the goal of having the blood pressure made normal with drugs. 110 over 70 or less, that's the goal. Well, that goal results in more death and disability, more heart attacks. And you probably are all aware of this. It's uh, called the U, U or J-shaped phenomenon of mortality. What happens is uh, when the diastolic is high, we're looking at diastolic numbers here. When it's high and if you treat, say it's 120, when you treat the, the blood pressure, the, the risk of heart attacks and death decreases until you hit a level of about 95 millimeters of mercury on diastolic. Certainly no, no lower than 85 millimeters of mercury, and then the risk of death increases. It's called the J or U, U, U phenomenon of mortality. It's been written about for over 30 years. And it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Here you have, you have a, a patient whose blood vessel system is all clogged up. It's full of sludge from what they ate. Their arteries are in spasm. The, the heart and the body perceives there's problems. We're not delivering the nutrients to the tissues because of all this peripheral resistance. So what, what do we need to do, the body says to itself. It says, well, we need to increase the pressure in the system so the pressure goes up. And so what do we do as agents of medical care? agents of the pharmaceutical industry is we poison the system at various levels. We poison the heart with beta blockers, we poison the arteries with calcium channel blockers, we poison the kidneys with diuretics, and the blood pressure comes down as expected, but what happens to all that effort the body is making to deliver nutrients to the tissues? Yeah, what happens is that effort is stopped. And the consequence is you decrease perfusion pressure to the tissues and the patient dies. Well, at least he died with a normal blood pressure, right? <laughs> okay, so diet and lifestyle. What does diet and lifestyle do? Diet and lifestyle re re reduces uh, risk factors for strokes, like blood pressure and cholesterol and obesity, and it also reduces strokes. A review of the literature presented in 2006 shows a diet low in sodium, high in potassium, rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grain, cereal fiber, and fatty fish. I would make a contention with that one, but we'll do that in another lecture will likely reduce the incidence of strokes.